as we discussed in the last episode, using teams of robots that collaborate by means of sharing information and somehow pursuing the same objective can result in robust, scalable, and safe autonomous systems. However, accomplishing this in reality has its own challenges. What kind of information should a single robot measure and share? What actions should it take to help itself and the other robots achieve that common objective? Our first networked robotic controller coming up in this episode. My name is Yusuf, and I'm a third year robotics PhD here at Georgia Tech. Today, we will solve our first multi robot problem. And although it's a fairly simple problem, its solution will contain all the essential ingredients for the more advanced controllers we will see later on. The problem statement is as follows Given a set of N robots, how do we make them all meet at a common location? Today's problem is to find a control law that drives a team of robots from their initial positions to a common final location. Before attempting to solve this question, we need to establish a control model. That is, a relationship between the variables that describe the configuration of a robot and those quantities we can manipulate to affect their behavior, which could be, for example, the velocities of the wheels, the steering angles of a pair of steering wheels, brakes, or something else. In order to keep things simple, we will assume that our robots are described by dots on a plane, and the respective velocities can be directly controlled. Due to its simplicity, this is a common model, and it is called the single integrator model. According to this model, the configuration of the robots is completely described by its position x, and the variable that we can control is its velocity, v. Then, the model says that the derivative of the position is equal to the velocity that we impose on the robot. The question we want to answer now is the following. What should the velocity of each robot be for all the robots' positions to have the same value? Let's now propose a possible solution to our problem. We pick a location in the plane, and we look for a control law that would move each robot to this location. There are a lot of possible control laws that could serve this purpose. For simplicity, we suggest that the velocity of each robot should be proportional to the distance between the position of the robot itself, xi, and the common goal, xj. Let's see what would happen to a team of robots following this control law. In this first experiment, we're going to try out our first strategy, where a team of seven robots will drive from their initial location to a desired final location. As we can see, the robots did drive to a common location, and they all ended up meeting. Problem solved, let's go home. Not quite. By looking at the result of our experiment, it seems like we were successful in achieving our objective. However, there is a major flaw with our attempt, which is that the robots were not collaborating. In fact, they were not interacting at all. When proposing the solution we just described, we implicitly made a few strong assumptions. First, we need to define a global position for the robots to meet. So the assumption we made here is that we can somehow share this meeting position to the robots, which requires some communication capabilities. However, in practice, this is a restrictive assumption. But remember that as long as the robots meet, the problem is solved, regardless of their final location. In addition, the robots need to measure the distance from the goal, or at least have knowledge about their own location and the location of the meeting point. Also, other than these two strong assumptions we just made, as mentioned earlier, when using the strategy, the robots are acting completely independently from one another, and there is no flow of information. In order to make our way to more interesting solutions, we first need to clarify what the robots can and cannot measure. So for now, we're going to assume that the robots can measure the distance between them and the other robots. For example, given two robots, robot 1 and robot 2, we're going to assume that robot 1 can measure the distance between itself and robot 2, and that robot 2 can do the same and can measure the distance between robot 1 and itself. With this assumption in mind, we propose a second control law, where robot 1 moves towards robot 2, and robot 2 moves towards robot 1. We can design a control law similar to the one we discussed in the previous slide, where now robots move towards each other as opposed to moving towards a fixed location. Note that this is possible given what we are assuming the robots can measure. To formally study the resulting behavior obtained from this controller, 
we start by defining an error quantity that describes the distance between x1 and x2. Notice that for the robots to meet, this error needs to eventually go to zero. To capture the evolution of the error over time, we compute its time derivative. By substituting the dynamics of x1 and x2 subject to the proposed control law, we obtain a first order differential equation. From linear system theory, we know that if gamma 1 plus gamma 2 is positive, then the solution to this equation asymptotically approaches zero. Let's now extend the same idea to more than two robots. In this case, we need to take into account the fact that robots can measure their relative distance with respect to more than a single robot. For a given robot i, we call this group of robots the neighbors of robot i, and we denote them with curly n sub i. Then, instead of moving towards a specific robot, as in the two robot case, we assume that each robot moves towards the average position, or center of mass, of its neighbors. We denote the center of mass of robot i's neighbors as xcm of i. Notice that the number of neighbors of robot i is denoted by the curly n sub i between vertical lines. One thing to observe is that computing the value of xcm of i in practice is not possible given the measuring assumptions we introduced earlier, as robots can only measure relative distances, not the global position of their neighbors. In order to show why this is still a good approach, let's expand the definition of center of mass. In particular, we, by adding and subtracting the value of xi from the decision of xcm of i, we obtain an equivalent representation that we can plug in directly to the control dynamics of robot i. Finally, by acknowledging that the quantity gamma sub i divided by the number of neighbors of robot i can be simply treated as a scaling factor only affecting the rate of convergence of the solution, we obtain a final expression for the dynamics of robot i. According to these dynamics, the velocity of each robot is equal to the sum of the relative positions of its neighbors with respect to itself. We call this very important equation the consensus equation. Let's see how this consensus equation works out in practice. In this experiment, we're going to see a team of seven robots, each of which is going to move towards the center of mass of their neighbors. This is it, our first network robotic protocol working like a charm. This is the point where we should ask those four famous questions we introduced in the first episode. First, is the consensus equation scalable? Well, yes. If we add 10, 100, 1,000 more robots, each robot is still going to act with respect to the information you measure from the direct neighbors. Second, is the equation uh, decentralized? Also in this case, the answer is yes. Robots are not receiving information on where to move based on some supervising entity dictating where to go or where not to go. Then, uh, is the consensus equation uh, local? The answer is once again, yes. The robots are acting on a measure quantity, the center of mass of the neighbors, which is uh, measured in the local reference frame of each robot. For this reason, it doesn't really matter if the robots are on Earth, on Mars, or on Jupiter. They are going to do the same thing regardless of where they are. The final question that we should ask is, uh, is the consensus equation safe? Well, as we could see in the experiment, the robots really didn't crash on each other but uh, there is nothing in the consensus equation that actually prevents them from happening. The reason why our robots didn't crash on each other is because of some magic that we have here at the Robotarium, which is called control barrier functions, and we are going to talk about that in a future episode. The results of the experiment we just run look great. However, there is an important consideration we should make at this point. We derive our equation, the consensus equation, assuming robots were points whose velocity could be moved in any direction. However, this is a point and this is one of our robots at the Robotarium. Can you see the difference? Wheels. One of the most relevant features of mobile robots, like the one used here at the Robotarium, is the presence of wheels. The practical convenience of turning static friction into rolling friction comes at the cost of making simple models, like the single integrator, not necessarily the best description of a system. In order to overcome this fact, we need models that more precisely capture the physical features of our robots. An extremely popular model for planar robots, in particular for those with wheels, is the unicycle model. In addition to the x and y position of the robot used as a unique quantity of interest in the single integrator model, 
We now also consider the orientation of the robot, which we denote with theta. This simple addition allows us to describe rigid bodies as opposed to just points. Finally, in order to capture the fact that wheel robots cannot move sideways, we constrain the velocity of the robot to be described by a linear component, v, that represents the speed of the robot along the direction orthogonal to the wheel axis, and an angular velocity, omega, that represents how fast the robot rotates around its out-of-the-plane axis. A good question to ask now is uh, how can we relate the easy-to-work-with single integrator model and the more realistic unicycle model? In order to answer this question, we consider a virtual point located on the perpendicular bisector of the robot's axle at a distance L from the center of the robot. This new virtual point has coordinates X tilde and Y tilde. Then, the geometrical relationship between these two points is described by the quantities L times cos theta and L times sin theta. Deriving this expression with respect to time, we obtain the velocity of the virtual point with respect to the time derivatives of x, y, and theta. By relating the unicycle and the Lukaid point dynamics, we obtain something similar to a single integrator model, in the sense that we have the velocity of a single point, but that depends on the unicycle variables of linear and angular velocity, v and omega, and robots heading theta. Finally, we put the final equation into a matrix form, and by noting that it is nearly always invertible, we can write v and omega as functions of the velocity of a single point. In conclusion, thanks to this magic trick, we can design algorithms for our robot as if they were single points, and then compute the velocity we need to apply to a more realistic model of the robot in order to almost achieve the same behavior. A very reasonable question one could ask at this point is uh, why do we need all these different models to move a robot? Also, why didn't we start with a unicycle model in the first place? Or what are the features of a good model? And finally, a very good question is uh, do we always need a model when trying to move a robot? So a model is a mathematical representation of the physical system that you're trying to study. And it should be substantially simpler than the physics underlying the physical system itself. So for example, a mathematical model might be a system of ordinary differential equations, or it could be a system of partial differential equations, or it could even be a computer program or an algorithm, or it could be a lookup table if you've collected data from a system and stored it, for example, in a lookup table in a simulink block. So you should always ask yourself these three questions when you have a model. You should ask yourself, what are the model's properties, its predictive capabilities, and its limitations? So for the properties, you need to understand if the model that you have is capable of producing the type of properties that are in the physical system that you're trying to study. The second question you should ask yourself is what are the predictive capabilities? Because ultimately you want to use this model in order to predict something about how the system will behave, for example, under a different control input for you to be able to create a controller for that system. And the third question you should always ask yourself is what are the limitations of the, of the model that I have for this system? So for example, is the model missing an important component of the system that I'm trying to study? And if so, how can I add that component into my model to make it a little bit more complicated, but, but better represent the physical system at hand? And you might want multiple types of models for uh, the same system, depending on the types of questions you're trying to answer. For example, if you're trying to model an autonomous vehicle, you might include tire slip in some cases, where you might omit it in others. So for example, if you're trying to route multiple uh, autonomous vehicles, tire slip may not be so important, but if you're trying to understand how an autonomous vehicle will drive in adverse weather conditions, tire slip would be an important phenomenon to include in your model. So in the age of big data, you might ask yourself, do I even need a model of my system? If I can collect large amounts of data from my system, can I just use that data directly to try to control or try to understand the physical properties of the system? This technique might work in some cases, but for many robotics applications, the physics of the system are very well understood, and it's not too difficult to create a rather simple model that captures a lot of the phenomenon of interest. So in those cases, uh, it makes a lot of sense to start with a model. Now, what you might be interested in doing is combining those models, those mathematical uh, equations, with data that you're collecting in real time. And if you collect this data, then you can combine it with the model that you have and create better and better and higher fidelity models over time.
Before concluding today's episodes, there is one last question we should ask about the consensus equation we derived. What makes two robots neighbors? For example, we assume the robot could measure the distance from their neighbors, but in reality, sensors have a finite range. So what happens, for example, if a robot moves too far away from another robot? Or what if a robot is so far away from all the other robots in the team that it doesn't have any neighbors to measure the center of mass? What will you do in this case? Questions like this become relevant when we are going to deploy our algorithms on real robots. And as we will see, they are going to have a special role in what is coming in the next episodes. In conclusion today, we learned our first network robotic algorithms, which is meant to do a very simple thing. Just take a bunch of robots and crush them together, or almost. In the next episodes, we are going to explore a little bit more the tools that we need to be a little bit more formal about the problem we introduced. And we are going to see how the consensus equation is going to be a building block for more complex behaviors. Until then, don't forget to like and subscribe the channel. And remember that all the code that we use for our experiments here at the Robotarium is going to be available on the GitHub page of the Robotarium. Links in the description. Thanks for watching.